Good morning, everybody, and happy Aloha Friday. Welcome to PSG of Mercer County. It's another one of our virtual meetings. I believe this is our 20th virtual meeting. So since the pandemic, we were able to pivot and be able to continue to provide uh, quality speakers and good information for you. And uh, we'll continue to do that. Uh, we are now planning actually to keep our virtual meetings active at least through the end of this year, because even if social distancing wanes a little bit, uh, I think it may be hard for a large group, and we typically will be large in person. I think it'll be hard for a large group to still get together in person, at least through the end of the year, but we'll make the decision later on in the year. And in addition to being our happy Aloha Friday, and I, of course, and maybe a few of you too are wearing a Hawaiian shirt, today is actually the 55th birthday of JK Rowling's. So if there are any uh, young adult fans, and of course, Harry Potter, uh, ha oh, we've got a, Someone has their microphone on, so I will ask you, please make sure your microphone, is, there it is, okay? Please make sure your microphones are off. So J.K. Rowling's, of course, uh, the writer of the Harry Potter series and other uh, young adult books a lot of us enjoy. So today is her 55th birthday. And also, because I'm a bit of a, a 60s and 70s NASA and space geek, 49 years ago, men first drove on the moon. So, of course, in 1969, people or men landed on the moon, but Apollo 15 landed on the moon uh, 49 years ago yesterday, and they brought to, with them a kind of a moon dune buggy, and they started driving around on the moon. And so that was Apollo 15 was the first to do that, and uh, 49 years ago in 1971. And uh, the mission commander, his name is David Scott, is actually still alive. He's 88 years old. And so he was um, the commander of the mission, and he was also the, uh, the driver of the, the moon buggy. So a little bit of history for today. <laughs> Want to let you know a little bit more about our group here at PSG of Mercer County. We do provide a lot of resources for you in addition to these weekly meetings, all meant to help you make your job search a bit more efficient and effective. So and sadly, we can't give you a job, uh, but we try and give you the tools and the skills and the courage and everything else you need to be more efficient and effective in your own job search. Of course, today we have a presentation from Mike Carr, and I'll introduce him in a moment. We also have our LinkedIn group. Our LinkedIn group is a private group for just us, anyone who's been a member or attended any of our uh, in-person or virtual meetings. So if you're joining us today for the first time, welcome. Go look for our LinkedIn group called PSG of Mercer County. It's easy to find on LinkedIn. There's a join button, click the join button, and you will be put in pending status. Now, if you and I haven't met before, I may not accept you right away because I'm only going to accept people uh, that either I see in our attendance or that I know uh, that we've met. So you can also send me an email at our email address, psgofmercercounty at gmail.com psg of mercer county at gmail.com just say hey david i was on the meeting on uh, friday where michael presented i applied for i asked to join the group please let me in fine and then we'll let you in just that simple the reason why we keep it a bit of a private group we're trying to keep the name collectors and the list collectors out people that are joining just to try and get more people for their own benefit salesmen and such so go join our group. We have over 1,590, 1,590 people in the group, all people that have been through job search. So it's a good group of people to be connected with because as you extend your network and reach out to some of these people, there's a good chance they understand job search and the need for communicating with people. If you communicate with them, likely they'll communicate back with you. We do also have our website, psgofmercercounty.org, psgofmercercounty.org. Uh, it's more than a landing page. It's over 120 pages of assorted content, all for job seekers. And so you may want to take a look at the website. We do have job search pages. And what we have in those job board pages are links to over 2,600 company career pages. And these are companies that have offices just in Mercer County and our six border counties. So it's kind of our geographic service area. I do realize some of you on the call are from outside that area and that's fine. 
but being PhD of Mercer County, we kind of kept the job boards, at least so far, um, within, I guess, a 40 or 50 mile radius of us. So, uh, but what we do is uh, you go to the county, it's a link, then from there, up to 12 categories will pop up, like financial services and education, not-for-profits is different that are there. And when you click on the category, the companies in that county in that category will pop up, and those links go to that company's career pages. Now, it could be that that company is multi-state and some of the jobs are outside of New Jersey, but um, these are companies that we know, at least when we did the initial research, had some sort of business presence in New Jersey. Among the things we kind of kept out were the fast food restaurants and other small local businesses because you know people just know them very well. So that is our website. Um, we do like to, when we know about it, celebrate any landings. I haven't specifically heard from anyone uh, this week, last week, we had heard about two landings, so I'm glad that was the case. Uh, uh, companies are still interviewing and hiring. Stay active in the process. Uh, if you want to tell us all about a landing, you can put that in the chat. Uh, on our on our go to meeting chat is in the upper right corner. You click the little kind of cartoon bubble. You probably see it there with some red number next to it. Uh, so you could put that information there, and we could virtually congratulate you. Uh, let me know, let me tell you about some of our ground rules. So please, of course, um, uh, keep your audio or your microphone on mute. And so during the presentation, I will be trying to keep my eye on that. If I hear any background noise, I will do my best to squash it. And uh, as for your uh, your camera, um, that's up to you. If you want to keep it on, you're welcome to. If you don't want to put it on, you're welcome to as well. Uh, the, you know, Mostly uh, it's for your own benefit. Uh, towards the end of the meeting, when the meeting is over, we'll keep the uh, session open for a few minutes. That may be a good time to put the uh, camera back on for a little bit of virtual networking. So keep your audio, of course, on mute. Video and camera are up to you. Um, questions and answers. We're going to be doing Q&A through chat. And so, again, chat is that little bubble in the upper right corner. Uh, it looks like a cartoon character bubble when they talk. So what I will ask you to do, if you have a question, just post it in there. Type it in. But before the question, please write the word question. For instance, right now, there are over 20 messages in chat, and I, it's hard for me to kind of read every message, and a lot of them are probably introductions and contact information. It's going to be hard for me to keep up with the questions if I have to read between them. So put the word, you know, question, if you have a question for Mike, and the question could be whatever it is of interest, maybe a point on his slide. Uh, Mike has agreed that uh, every couple of slides, he's going to take a bit of a break just to see if there are questions. Uh, we'll read them out loud, so make sure everyone can hear them and give Mike uh, the opportunity to answer them. And there'll be a Q&A period at the end. Again, we'll be chat. Uh, because we typically expect to have a large crowd, we have over 90 right now, just turning on the microphone so questions can get a bit messy. So we found using chat for Q&A is helpful. Remember, put the word question just preceding your actual question. So those are our ground rules. And remember, keep your microphone on mute and we will get ourselves into the presentation right now. So PSG of Mercer County is just very pleased to welcome Michael Carr. Uh, Mike is a global service operations leader with Dun & Bradstreet in Short Hills, where he leads a team of 12. Prior to joining D&B in December 2017, Mike was in transition for 21 months, having been laid off at the age of 57 and he's after spending 35 years with one company. When Mike landed, he made a commitment to give back to the job search community. Part of that commitment was to develop development of this presentation. In his current role, Mike has recruited four open positions on his team, leveraging everything he learned during his own transition period. He's cataloged those errors he has seen job seekers repeatedly make and brings them to us as this guide of simple steps that we could take to differentiate ourselves from the competitive job market. Uh, PSG of Mercer County, as a, as a PSG of Mercer County alumni, Mike has extensive operations and finance experience from leading transformational assignments in both North America and Europe. A native of Newcastle, England, I love your brown ale. <laughs> A native of Newcastle, England, he now resides near Flemington, New Jersey with his wife and two children. So PSG of Mercer County is just pleased to welcome back our alum, Mike Carr. Thank you, David. Um, yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, it is actually a, it's a real pleasure for me to, to be doing this. Uh, 
as David said, I am a, a PSG Mercer County alumni. Uh, I don't know if you can tell. I, am, I do have a Hawaiian shirt on in uh, in honor in honor of that. Um, and as I said, it's 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 a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I am the uh, the global service operations leader for uh, for Dun and Bradstreet in in Short Hills, and I do lead a, t a team of twelve. And uh, have hired four people over the course of uh, of the last. Uh, 12 months because that team has grown from five when I first started with DMB to to 12 people as it stands now. And what I noticed over the course of that that hiring process was that things that I had come to understand as being uh, the the basics of the of my job search, I wasn't seeing those being done by by candidly the majority of of candidates. And so. I wanted to, uh, to to come back to the community and, and kind of point that out and and make it clear that um, there's an opportunity for you to to differentiate yourself by by doing these basics well. Um, I gave the first version of this of this deck, uh, made the first pre presentation back in February, um, back to uh, PSG of Central New Jersey back in in Somerville. Um, I thought it was only going to be a, a one-off. Uh, but I got such a positive response that I decided to take it on the road. So this is actually uh, the fourth time, fourth time I've done this, and um, and I'm certainly am willing to do it again if if the if the response or the need is there. You'll uh, you'll see that this deck uh, is a little wordy. Um, uh, right before I made that first presentation back in February, I actually took a uh, uh, in preparation. I kind of took a, an effective presentation skills class uh, through through work. And one of the recommendations was, you know, have more pictures than words. Well, at that point, it was kind of too late. Um, so I, I, I didn't change the deck. Um, so please don't feel obligated to read all the words. It's really more important that you listen. Uh, I have thrown in a gratuitous picture half about halfway through the deck that will, uh, that, um, it's kind of actually pretty meaningful and we'll talk about that when we get there. But it's it's more important actually that you, that you listen. Don't feel obligated to, uh, to read all the words, the deck is going to be made available uh, after the presentation. You can dive into it more then if uh, if you if you need to. So just before we get going, just a little bit of background about about me. Um, as David mentioned, I was laid off from uh, from Unisys at the age of uh, 58 after having been there for for 35 years. Um, the first message, first part of that message is that. Uh, Clearly, I, I stayed there too long. That was a lesson I learned uh, too late as part of that process. Um, I kind of justified to myself being there because I moved from from finance to operations. I relocated with them eight times, both domestically and internationally. So I, through the course of that time, I justified myself being there, but I was there too long. I survived six changes of, of CEOs, and the uh, the seventh change got me. And it was kind of the classic scenario of a a change of CEO in uh, in April, and then the uh, the president of my division left in uh, in July, and then my boss left in uh, December. And at that point, you would have thought that the alarm bells would be ringing for me, uh, but they weren't. And then one February Tuesday, uh, the, actually the next February Tuesday, you know, on a Tuesday, my my boss, my new boss, called me up to give me my bonus, and then. The following Thursday called me up to lay me off over the telephone after 35 years, and I was terrified. I had, you know, I had I had looked periodically during the course of those those all those years, but never really seriously. And so, you know, there I was after all that time, you know, a complete rookie in the in the job search business. Um, I, you know, I did get some uh, some job placement assistance, so you know, had some help crafting a resume. Um, I was lucky enough to. Um, I also uh, found PSG of CNJ and and attended their ACT uh, courseware, so had some further assistance there. I found PSG Mercer County and and got lots of assistance from this group, and a couple of other um, networking groups. So, you know, was was able to get some pretty good grounding, but. It took 21 months, you know, 400 plus applications, in, interviews with 60 plus different companies, getting so close on a, on a number of different occasions, you know, multiple interviews with several different companies, getting all the way down to, you know, thinking you were getting, you know, the offer was coming and then having it falling apart at various different times. 
Um, I obviously I volunteered at uh, PSG CNJ for a period of time. I also, um, I mean, you get, you get to the point where you do whatever you, you have to do. So I actually also worked at an Amazon warehouse for three months because uh, my wife is a two-time ovarian cancer survivor and we couldn't afford a single day without benefits. So I had to do that. You basically do whatever, and you know, everyone on this phone you know, knows this, you, you do whatever it takes. Um, until I was lucky enough to land at, at Dun & Bradstreet in uh, December of, of 2017. My journey, um, or you know, the way I landed, um, ended up being through networking. Uh, it was through a, a former colleague of mine at Unisys who had landed at DMB a couple of months earlier. We had stayed in contact. Um, he, uh, you know, we'd had lunch a couple of times, uh, again, you know, stayed in contact. After he landed at DMB, he called me up after a month or so and he said, Mike, they really need you here. Uh, and as luck would have it, they had a, they had a role. Um, and fortunately enough, he was able to get me in front of the hiring manager. And, you know, again, I was lucky enough to land. So, um, really my, my, my message here is that, you know, I, I have tremendous empathy for for the for the you know the folks on this on this uh, this call because I have been through what you what most many of you are going through and have now sat on the other side of the table to recruit for four roles and so I want to share some advice based on my role as a hiring manager and re and relatively recent job seeker and that's really what uh, this this presentation is is all about so here's what I plan to talk about um, and first of all, I'm going to tell you why you should listen. And then I'll take you through four or five of my observations as a hiring manager. And, and you're going to find that they're, they're, they're very, they're actually very basic. And, um, that may surprise you. Um, uh, but, but really what you're going to walk away from this presentation with is if you do these four or five things and you do them well, uh, even though they are very basic, you will you you have the opportunity to differentiate yourself, because I can tell you as the person sitting across the the table, I have a set of expectations, and my expectations include these four or five things, and when you're not meeting them, you're putting yourself at a disadvantage. <clears throat> I'll cover those things, and I'll then just give you a few thoughts from. Uh, my role as a networker, again, from both sides of the tab table. Um, I'll give you some observations from a conversation I had with uh, with HR at DNB. Um, again, uh, many of you probably have the impression of HR being uh, the enemy. I know when I sat as a in in a job search role, I definitely felt HR was the enemy. Uh, they actually may not be, and I'll tell you why. Uh, we'll dispel a couple of myths. I'll Give you my take on a couple of tools that I think you could be use be using. Uh, I'll offer you the opportunity to connect, and then we'll close out with um, with a few final thoughts. Uh, as David said, we'll do Q and A. Um, if we were doing this in person, I would love for this to be as interactive as possible. That doesn't work so well uh, through a you know through uh, through a go to meeting meeting like this. But I will stop uh, at several occasions. To, uh, to take uh, questions through chat, um, just so we can uh, we can keep this as as quasi interactive as we as we possibly can. And here's why you should listen. Um, I'm not here to uh, I'm not here to sell you anything. I don't have a book to promote. I'm uh, not a professional resume writer or anything like that. Instead, I am I really am legitimately trying to pay this forward. Um, when I finally did land, I I actually went to uh, Princeton, I went to Somerville, and I went to the uh, to the Hillsdale group that I was also a, a member of up in uh, northern New Jersey. That's Janelle Rizzino's group, and I I kind of told told my story of how I came to land, and I made a commitment to those three groups um, that I would do whatever I could to help anybody who had, who was in. The position that I was just leaving, you know, having been out out for 21 months, I would do whatever I could to help anybody to to land. So, I've I've walked in your shoes, um, and I'm I will do whatever I can to help anybody 
uh, to land because I know what you're going through is a roller coaster. I know it sucks. Um, and like I said, I'll, I'll do whatever I can to help. Um, like I said, you may not learn anything new in the next, you know, uh, half an hour, 45 minutes, whatever, however long it takes. But if you uh, remember nothing else, just remember that the basics really do count. Um, and I should also say, uh, I'm actually really not here representing Dun & Bradstreet, but I am here because uh, they actually really do have a commitment to do good in the community. And uh, whilst I'm actually, uh, actually took uh, the day off uh, to do this presentation, they do actually uh, encourage and do allow time uh, to uh, employees to, uh, to uh, give back to the community. Um, and it's a serious commitment on, uh, on their part. So let's get going. Observations uh, as a hiring manager. So we're going to talk about five things. We're going to talk about cover letters, resumes, LinkedIn, uh, research, and how you parlay, parlay that research into, uh, into questions and thank you notes. And, and as I said, there's no, there's no rocket science there. They're, they're, these, those are going to strike you as very basic things, uh, but they are uh, extremely important. But before we dive into that, just a, just a couple of just a couple of things. Um, a couple of things in terms of first of all, my process as a hiring manager, the process I go through as a hiring manager, and then a quick uh, thumbnail as to how uh, Dun & Bradstreet, uh, how they how the hiring process works at Dun & Bradstreet. Um, in terms of my personal process as a, as a hiring manager, I use a process called uh, targeted selection. Uh, many years ago, at, well, while I was at Unisys, actually, um, I was lucky enough to, uh, to get to go uh, on an international assignment uh, back to the UK. Um, and I was, I, the assignment was to set up a, a supply chain function back in, the, back in, in Europe, actually. And it was setting it up from scratch, so we had to we actually had to set up a function and hire over 100 people, and so we needed a we needed a process by which to do that. And so uh, the team that was helping me with with the hiring, we were taught this process of targeted selection, and it's it's nothing more that than when you're when you're when you're trying to fill a role, there are there are five or six elements of that role that are, that are critical to you. You're looking for five or six things in a in a candidate that you want to make sure that the candidate has. And so, um, when you're when you're interviewing for, for when you're interviewing the candidate, your your questions are geared around those those five or six things. And what you do is at the end of the interview, you score the candidate against those five or six, five or six things, on a rating scale of you know maybe one to five. And the theory is when you when you've scored all of the candidates that you're you're talking to, um, the highest scoring candidate should be the candidate that you hire. And I've actually found that um, that it works. Uh, hiring otherwise can be a very much a gut feel kind of process. And so the, what that what that approach does, it puts a little bit of uh, of, of you know of empirical sort of data behind what is otherwise uh, often gut feel. And I found that it, it to be very uh, very helpful to me in, as part of that process. So so I use that uh, I use that approach. Um, from a Dun & Bradstreet perspective, uh, whenever you're trying to fill a role, once the, uh, once the requisition is approved, you're immediately paired with, a, with an internal recruiter. And you, uh, you meet with uh, that recruiter to, first of all, discuss exactly what it is you're, uh, you're looking for. Um, and then it's the recruiter's you know, job to, to, you know, to post the requisition, both, uh, both on the Dun & Bradstreet site and then to uh, to all of the you know the other sites LinkedIn, Indeed, and and all the other uh, online online portals. And then uh, generally, what happens is the recruiter will share you know one or two resumes to get a sense of you know are those resumes hitting hitting the spot. Uh, and he once he has a sense then of whether they are or they are not, he'll start to screen candidates. And then based on his screening, he'll present an initial slate. Um, and generally, we'll narrow that slate down to, to generally five or six candidates that I will then, once he's done a phone screen, I will then screen 
five or six, we'll narrow the five or six down to two or three that I would, under ordinary circumstances, do face to face. Now it would likely be, you know, a video interview. Uh, and from that five or six, we would narrow it down to two or three and then either make a decision there and then, or if uh, it was a more senior role, maybe have the uh, have the person to interview with some of my peers. Uh, and then always out of courtesy, I would have the final candidate meet with my meet with my boss just to give my boss the chance to uh, to meet the candidate before a final decision is made. Uh, once we've made once we've landed on the candidate, uh, all of the negotiation is then handled by the recruiter. So I don't get involved in any of the the salary negotiation. That's all done by the recruiter. Um, and only when and we've agreed basically a range within which we want to land the candidate because. Obviously, the budget sits with us, but uh, as long as he can land the, the candidate within that range, he has the, you know, the authority to to do the negotiation. If he has to go outside that range, then he comes back, uh, and we and we decide if we're if we're prepared to go outside the range, and then hopefully we we come to successful conclusion. So I just wanted to give that as a little bit of perspective, just because I know there's there's quite a bit of mystery as to as to how that whole process. Uh, works and so I just want to share because that's been a lot of Q and A as I've done this previously. There's been a lot of Q and A about how that how that process works. So I I want to share that. Uh, I like to share that now just to give uh, some perspective. So let's talk a little bit about uh, cover letters. And um, I know there's. Uh, I know from having been on the other side of the table, there's, a real, there's always the question. You know, if I write one, is it ever? Is it? You know, does anyone ever read them? Um, the answer to that is uh, yes. They are. They are read. Uh, the reality. The reality from as I came to realize it is that very few people write them. And so, what you should understand from that is that when if you do write one, it represents a tremendous opportunity again for you to differentiate yourself. And if you do write one, I'm going to read it. Um, you know, there there are all kinds of different types of of cover letters. You know, there's the uh, there's the, uh, the you know the, uh, the, the that old T-bone thing with you know the idea you put you pick out three key things from the the job description and you you highlight those and then you you say how you uh, how you come how you compare to those three things. I also remember I went to uh, Newtown Networking one evening, uh, Newtown in Pennsylvania, and there was a guy who made a presentation. He had written a book about the the best bleeping uh, cover letter ever. So I tried his method for a, for a while. Uh, for me, it's it's not necessarily important, you know, the type of cover letter that you try. It's more important that it's uh, that it's well written, you know, that it's. Um, that it doesn't have grammatical errors, that it's that it's that it's well written, that it's not overly long, um, you know that kind of thing. Uh, and and let me give you an example of of one that I used and and how it worked for me. Um, because it's particularly important to use a cover letter in a situation where you're perhaps applying for or going out for a role where it's not obvious why you might be an immediate fit. And, and what I mean by that was, uh, is um, I was a, originally in the early first half of my career, I was a finance guy. Um, and I made, to, made the move to operations when I actually went to, to set up that uh, supply chain organization in Europe. That was when I, I made the move to operations. So periodically while in transition, I found myself occasionally drawn to roles that had a finance element in them. And there was one particular role at a uh, a private school in Melbourne, which was actually a, a, a finance and operations role that I was that I was drawn to at a, at, a, at a private school. Not a role that you could you could say was an, was immediately obvious that I would be a fit. You know, I was coming from a, a twenty thousand person organization in you know in business, and here was me applying for a role at a, a, a two hundred. Uh, you know, pupil private school, uh, again, in, back in a financy kind of role that, again, I wasn't the obvious fit for. But I decided and I thought about it and I decided I was going to take a run at it. So I applied for it, but then I realized, you know, I had to, I had to also 
send a compelling message to the to the hiring person that you know as to why it might make sense. So with it being a, a small private school, it wasn't hard to figure out who the head of school was, who was the hiring manager. You know, I, I, so I figured that out and uh, it was also equally easy to figure out her email address. And so along with making the application, I also, I sent her an email and I, I kept it, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a one page email, but I, but I wrote in this email, all of the reasons I addressed some of the obvious reasons why I thought it, I would, even while it wasn't obvious why I thought I could make a success of the role, why I wanted to make the move from business to to education, why I wanted to make a role the move from a, from this huge organization to this much more this educational bubble, you know that kind of stuff. And I wrote this what I thought was a a really good uh, cover letter, and I sent it to the head of school, um, and I got nothing. So I, I left it for for three or four weeks. Uh, the role was still out there, so they they apparently hadn't filled it. And so you know, I I I went back, and I again customized the letter. I I made the letter sort of um, customized to where I thought she was within you know the the period of the school year that it that it was, um, and uh, went back to her again. And, and again, I got nothing. And I, I run uh, along the, the, the theme of kind of three strikes and you're out. So um, I got to the, again, checked after a couple of weeks. And again, the role wasn't, wasn't filled. It was still out there on the website. I, I imagined to myself that maybe she was having trouble filling it. Um, and and this, they were in the, it was in the summer now. Um, so I went back for my third attempt. Again, customized the, the you know the email. Um, I I can't remember exactly. I may have inferred you know maybe she was having trouble filling the role, and I was still really really interested and you know hoped that she might uh, give me the opportunity to at least discuss the role with her. I sent the third third email in, uh, and she bit. She came back and she uh, she invited me to come to the school uh, to meet with her. Um, I, uh, I, I thought uh, the discussion was just going to be with uh, with me and her. Uh, it turned out it was with me and her, and then she had me meet with you know the head of the upper school and the head of the lower school, and then to meet with uh, the, the couple of folks that would have reported to me. Um, so it ended up being you know quite an extensive set of discussions, but evidently it went well because. She then had me come back and meet with uh, the board of trustees. By which point I was starting to get. Uh, pretty excited that maybe something was going to happen, and uh, so I went back to meet with the uh, the board of trustees, and of course I didn't get the job. But the uh, but the, the the moral of the story there is that um, the 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 well crafted cover letter um, with a little bit of persistence opened opened the door. And, and got me in front of the hiring manager and 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 created an opportunity where perhaps if I had just you know mailed in the resume, I would never have gotten in front of her. And so my you know my message there is you know uh, cover 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 letters work. Um, they can make the bridge between you know just you know an application and and you creating the bridge to this is why I'm a great candidate for the role, and um, and and they are red, and and I'll reinforce this later on when I get to the conversation with uh, with the HR folks that I that I had at DMB. They are they are red, uh, and they can make a difference. So I'm going to pause there, David. I don't know if there are, if there are any any questions at this point, but let me pause there for a second. Yeah, perfect time, because if you were going to change slides, I would have interrupted and said the same thing. A couple of questions. One is from Dominic. Regarding finding finding you on LinkedIn, did you want the candidate to reach out to you via LinkedIn in mail before the interview? So um, I'm actually going to cover that um, in a little bit, but um, absolutely. In fact, in the four job descriptions that I posted for the four roles, I put clues in the job description, which were encouraging people to find me 
on LinkedIn. So I put in the job description that the role reported to the service operations leader located in Short Hills. And so if you just put service operations leader Dun & Bradstreet Short Hills, I would have popped up as the leader in that search. And then if you'd looked at my profile, you would have found my personal email address in my profile. And I would have expected you to do what I exactly I did with that, um, with the, uh, the head of school at the school that I applied to, which was, would have been to, in addition to applying to the role, send me your resume and your cover letter and tell me why you were a great candidate. For the four roles that I posted, only one person did that. And I gave him an interview. He didn't get the, he didn't get the job, but I gave, but I gave him an interview. I, so yes, I, I expect you, um, in this day and age, I expect you at least to have, to have researched me on LinkedIn as part of your, as part of the looking at the role process to have taken a look at me. And if, and if you're one of the five or six that I'm going to interview, I expect you to have checked me out because you should be looking for the things that you and I have in common. You know, did we go to the same school? Do we have any, do we have any people that we mutually know that you could have then reached out to and say, what do you know about Mike Carr? You know, what kind of guy is he? You know, you know what is he like? What are his hot buttons? So yes, absolutely. Okay. Uh, a couple questions more uh, from John. When applying for a job, I always check LinkedIn for connections or roles that I might be involved that might be involved in making the decision. If I am not connected, I send the connect request with a note. Typically, never hear an answer to request. Is this a good idea, and how can I increase the likelihood of hearing back? So I wouldn't if if I wouldn't expect you to connect with me prior to us having uh, us interviewing i wouldn't expect you to to do that but after we've after we've interviewed um whether or not you know we're taking things forward i'm perfectly okay with with you and i connecting i think okay. i think once we've once we've established a relationship and if we've had a good conversation in the interview then absolutely uh, connect from lee uh, this is a shortened statement Cover letter by USPS or email these days? Um, well, USPS is going to land on a desk that no one's attending uh, today. So it, I think uh, by by email. My uh, the school example was that I just gave was by email. Um, when we get back to a more normal scenario, um, and especially if you're doing uh, if you're trying to target companies, uh, which is something else that I did, and I I can touch on that a little bit later um a, a beautifully written letter sent by usps if you if you know you know where the person's located i think that can be very effective i i did that i tried a, a targeted campaign which i did by usps um and that got me conversations so i think either can work but i think today in the scenario we're in today you, you only have one choice you, you have to it has to be has to be email okay um, Tatiana asks, I heard that with salary negotiation, you can negotiate benefits like number of vacation days. Is this true? Um, I, I think for perhaps for more senior level positions, that's probably true. Um, uh, for, for lower level positions, likely not, unless, unless you're, you know, uh, I, for example, I, I did not negotiate vacation days when I joined DMB, but that's because DMB automatically gives you four weeks <clears throat> walking in the door. So I, I didn't, I didn't feel I needed any more. I can tell you my own observation. I've done exactly that twice. Yeah. Um, I've gotten uh, uh, more vacation days and in one case, a little bit more salary. And uh, we're not having specifically a salary discussion, but once you get the offer, that's your opportunity to have that level of discussion. Oh, I would absolutely, to. I would absolutely say yes. There's that you should absolutely negotiate, um, okay. and you should pick the you should pick the things that are that make sense for you to negotiate. Absolutely, David. I, I didn't want to, I shouldn't, didn't mean to imply don't negotiate. Yeah, no, no, uh, I but, you, but you pick the things that that you that are important to you. Um, as it turned out for me, vacation wasn't wasn't important to me. You know, benefits. Um, you know, you know, like you know, a benefits package. 
you know, it's unlikely that you're going to, you know, Dun & Bradstreet has a standard benefits package and unlikely you'll be able to negotiate that. Salary is open, is absolutely open to negotiation. Okay, here's a question from Simha. And Simha, take, listen to it because I'm having a hard time reading what you wrote. There's a couple of spelling mistakes here. So if I misrepresent it, type it again later. When you say a few people write a cover letter, would you be able to estimate as a percentage how aware received by you in your role? I'm not really sure that last I would, sentence. I, I, sorry, if he's asking how many people wrote a cover letter to me and during the hiring process, easily less than half. Okay. Less than half. I was, I, honestly, I was amazed. <clears throat> Say, Vivian wrote, what is too long? I'm assuming in the context of a cover letter. No more than a page. Okay. And and uh, folks, <clears throat> um, please write a complete question and with the context, because as we move on a little bit, we may lose the context. So yep. uh, Vivian, and using that as an example, what is too long? We're assuming it's the cover letter, but uh, folks, as you write your questions, please make sure it's uh, within the context. Yeah, anything, so longer, from, than, anything, anything longer than a page is going to be too long. Okay. Mitra wrote, why do they, in parentheses, HR manager, say it was between you and another candidate, but never say why you fell short to the other candidate so you can grow? Um, well, I, I, um, I can't answer that because I'm, I'm not in HR. I will tell you, um, <clears throat> I will tell you, uh, the HR person that I, that I've worked with on hiring for two of my roles is was prepared to give feedback to the candidate um and i can also tell you um and i've i'll, I'll come more to this uh, a little bit later on the networking side of things um i i referred someone also recently to to dmb um and he was a he was a really good uh, project manager uh, but he was going for a position in you can imagine dmb is a data company and he was going for a project manager role in 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 a data heavy group uh, so he ticked all the boxes from project management perspective but he didn't have the data and analytics side of things and so the recruiter went back to him and said you're a great project manager but you don't have this and 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 told him you know and told him that so i think in in certain situations they 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 will give you feedback um so i think it i think it varies from person one person to the next i as as the hiring person if you if 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 we've gotten down to you know you're one of the three uh, and if there is something that very obviously you know held you back from getting the position i will try and give you that feedback you know okay. or, or i will try and stress why the other person uh what set the other person uh, uh, you know aside so for example i when i when i filled the uh, the analyst <laughs> role that i just filled we hired a. We were very lucky to find a uh, a guy that had a, a a master's in business in business analytics from from um, Michigan State. Clearly set him apart from all the other candidates, and that was that that set him apart for me, and that's why we hired him. Um, and that was the differentiator, and that's what I told the other couple of candidates. So we Thank will you. try. We will try and give feedback where we can. One of the things that I've observed is, uh, in answering this question, don't get hung up in why you didn't get the job. Yeah. Because the reason is not is not objective. The reason is likely subjective. In other words, um, if you came in and you wore, um, uh, you know, a blue suit instead of a red suit, and they don't like blue and they like red you can't take that into the next interview in the next right. company yeah the, so, the, other, the other thing i would say david is if you got if you got down to that if you would got down to the if you were one of the three you know that i selected for example for you to come in and and you were you had you you can be pretty sure that you had just about everything that we were looking for so it did it then it then just as you were saying david it, it was there was something you know something subtle or or just one thing um that 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 set the other candidate apart so you don't you, you should not feel bad because at that stage you didn't get it because you were a very strong candidate at that point 
you beat okay. out you, you know if you were one of the three you beat out dozens of others okay darcy has a question is persistence and maintaining communication important during these times since companies can't present an offer aka budgets are changing um well persistence to a point like in the school example that i gave uh, i go by three strikes and then i back away so if if the uh, the head, this head of school hadn't bitten on the third attempt i would have said okay this isn't going to happen and i would have moved on so i i think you have to you have to recognize you know you, you sometimes you get so emotionally involved in some of these things that you you just you want so badly for it to happen but you have to realize after a period of time that you know it isn't going to happen it's it's not your fault they've moved on um and you have to back away Okay, Ali has a question. What advice would you have for someone who is about to complete college and thus will be entering the job market with little experience? Um, you, you still, I mean, people are hiring. The companies are still hiring. Um, it's, it's, it's. There's no doubt it's super competitive. But you, if, if you're ready to, if you're ready to enter the workplace, you should go for it, and. Um, you have every every likelihood and as as much likelihood of landing as as anybody else. Yep. Also, leverage projects that you've taken on at college. A lot of times, mm -hmm. when you're in your senior year, you get project work. Talk about those. Maybe you've had other uh, part time jobs with transferable skills, like customer yep. service and other things that can be very important for your new employer. Uh, highlight those as well. Make that part of your uh, value proposition. Yep. Joanne has a question. Should the content of the cover letter be an attached attachment or direct in the email? So um, I put it direct in the email. Yep. Okay. With it and then attached my resume. Kim has a question. Should one still send the cover letter if the position actually does not call for it? I normally send one only when it's required. Or I request it. I candidly, I'd send it every time. Okay. And by the way, if you are using one of those applicant tracking systems where you can upload multiple documents, yep. that's one way to do it. Absolutely. If the applicant tracking system only allows you to upload a single document, your resume, and you want to attach a cover letter, put the cover letter after the resume not before the resume. A lot of us naturally will think the cover letter will introduce the resume. But if they open up page one of the attachment, that's not a resume, they may not go on to page two. So put it at the end. Okay, good, let's move on. Great, so second second topic is, is resumes. Um, and the, for me, um, a couple of things. First of all, uh, two pages is, for me, unless, and I understand if you're in a that's you know scientific field or a field where it's important for you to demonstrate you know research that you've been involved been involved in or where you've been where you've been published, then you have to go as long as you have to go. But if you're just applying for a role, a regular role in business, then two pages is is it. Don't go beyond two pages. Um, it would drive me it would drive me nuts if people went beyond beyond two pages. Um, and uh, candidly, for me, I'm I'm generally I will read the whole thing, but I'm generally focusing on your most recent position, and then I'm I'm focusing on your uh, your education. I I do read the whole thing, and I'm also I was also really really surprised at um, how how often I would see resumes that didn't have this you know the whole notion of challenge action result cars. Pause. Yeah, you know, I've seen them called all kinds of different things, but that didn't have quantifiable uh, results within each of the accomplishments. Um, I, I saw a resume as recently as someone sent me their resume as recently as last week, and you know this this person had been, had maybe five or six different jobs throughout the course of their career, so you know had I don't know 25, 30 different accomplishments in their resume. One of them was quantified that's that's just not that's not a good resume it was otherwise it was just a string of i did this i did that with no quantification um you've you've got to be you've 
you've got to be able to quantify what you did. You know, I, I grew sales by X percent in Y time frame. Simple stuff like that. I saved X dollars in Y time frame. It, you know, it, you've got to give you've got to give the reader something to hang on to, and something and something to to catch their eye. Um, again, this that again might sound really basic. It's it's amazing how often people overlook that. So um, my what I what I did I obviously I again I had a little bit of help writing my resume up front through uh, through job placement. Um, candidly, coming out of that, I wasn't really happy with it. So I did a couple. Of, I did a couple of things. I um, I had some people look at it. I had some. I had uh, some other. You know, some folks I had come into contact through who were also. You know, who were in HR, uh, who were also in transition. I had them look at it. You know, they gave me some feedback. Um, I attended a couple of you know uh, seminars. So Gary Landy, for example, at Mercer County. He does uh, a seminar on on resumes. I attended Gary's session. Uh, Carol McCullough, who's on this seminar today, she used to do a session on you know how you'd format your resume to make sure it gets through the applicant tracking system. So I made sure I attended Carol's session. Um, careers in transition on on Saturday mornings, you have a chance to get a, f a free resume review. So I went there and had them kick the tires on my resume. So I, I, I availed myself, myself of those kinds of opportunities um, to have people look at my resume, and 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 eventually I was I was comfortable with it, um, and and eventually I satisfied myself that it was good enough, right? Because it was getting me in the door. I like I said I I interview I ended up interviewing with over sixty companies, so it was good enough to get me in the door. So I I was comfortable with it. You know, I was comfortable enough that it, my resume was not the issue, right? My resume was not the issue why I wasn't landing. You know, certainly I, I, I periodically went back to it. I looked at it. I, I tweaked it, but I didn't massively overhaul it. Um, I, you know, I, I became comfortable with it. Um, so uh, once you're comfortable with it, I, you know, I'd suggest you, you know, you leave it alone because if you're getting interviews, um, then your resume isn't the issue. That something else is the issue. Um, the one other thing you know you have to be ready to to explain is obviously if there are gaps in your resume, you have to be ready to explain those uh, when you start when you when you eventually have the conversation with uh, with whoever it is you're ultimately talking with. But um, you really you know the resume is 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 vitally important. Obviously, uh, you you all know that. So don't be afraid to have to get people you know to look at it. Um, but but once once you're comfortable with it, once it's getting you in the door, you know, um, you know, don't you know, don't be paranoid about it. It's you know, if it's getting you in the door, then it's it's probably good enough. So uh, third thing, which we've we kind of touched on through some of the questions that uh, that just came in, was I was candidly um, amazed that so few people try to find me as the uh, as the hiring manager on LinkedIn. As I said, I intentionally gave clues within the job description uh, so that people could find me, so that they could then send me a cover letter with their resume explaining why they might be a fit for the job, so that that could put them at the top of the pile uh, from, a, from a resume perspective. Because, you know, we got dozens and dozens of applicants for, for the roles that we uh, that we posted. And and if if you were to you know to to come at me with uh, you, you know your resume to my private email, uh, that would put you ahead of the game. So I intentionally put clues out there, and very few people took the time. Um, so uh, it's it's an opportunity. It's also an opportunity again. Um, if you're not an obvious fit for the role. It's an it's an opportunity for you to to try and find the hiring manager, and um, and to and to and to reach out to him. Uh, another example of that I did with that was a uh, a position early on in in my job search. Uh, I was interested in a role, an operations role, um, for a company called Ericsson Living. They run uh, elder care facilities in uh, on the eastern seaboard, 
and they had a they had a role for an operations director position at a facility in Warrington, Pennsylvania. Um, it was an operations role, but it was in a bit in an industry that I had no experience at. So I again I knew I couldn't just mail you know I couldn't just mail in the application. I had to I had to try and get to the hiring manager. So I knew the location. I I I knew the the uh, I knew the facility, and I, I knew that uh, the ex it was reporting to the executive director at that facility. So I put executive director for uh, the name of that facility in Warrington, Pennsylvania, and his name popped up on LinkedIn. It was very easy to figure out his email address, so I sent him a letter. I sent him a, you know, a cover letter with my resume, explaining why I thought I, you know, why I had the interest in the position and why I might be a fit, um, and I got an interview. Um, I didn't get the job, but again, the uh, finding the hiring manager on LinkedIn, sending the cover letter with my resume, uh, got opened the door, created the opportunity, um, got me the interview. I didn't get me the job, but uh, you know that getting getting oh creating the opportunity was 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 the important thing. And then you know I wasn't able to to close the opportunity, but that was you know that was a that was a different issue. But the, again, it was the the ability to find the hiring manager was uh, was the, was the important message here. So again, a quick pause to see if there are any other questions before we flip to the flip the slide, David. Um, <clears throat> yeah, Mike has one. When you've been out of a job for about twenty four months, how do you present your resume? Functional, etc. How far back do you go? Um. So I. Again, I was, I was a two-page resume. I included um, uh, my entire my entire career, but I summarized probably the second half. You know, the finance piece of my career was a very small piece of my resume, just to show what I had done. And it also kind of picked up on that, that international assignment piece of my career, which I wanted to make sure that you know, because that was an important sort of you know showing the the flip that I'd made to operations. Um, so I did chronological. Um, I, I bridged. For me, I bridged the uh, you know the the time from the layoff at Unisys to the current day by the fact that I had I was volunteering at uh, PSG CNJ. Um, you know, you can do it other ways by you know setting up your own consulting company, um, other volunteer work that you might do. So I did chronological. Okay, and Frank has a question along the lines for more experienced candidates, how far back should the resume capture? Since you look at the most recent experience only, should key jobs beyond 15 years be listed? I, I did, but I understand why you might uh, show less. I, again, I think that's that's personal preference. Yeah, if it's relevant to your position, it's probably fine. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. Thanks. Very good. So, um, Here's another fatal flaw: poor, poor research and inadequate questions. So there's a, there's an immediate red flag for me during the interview process. If uh, if you have no questions, uh, I don't care how good you are, uh, I'm not hiring you. Uh, and that, believe it or not, has happened. I have had I have had uh, candidates that I've that I've talked to, you know, who, who have been good enough. You know, they've passed the um, they've passed the HR screen. They've made it to you know, the, uh, they've been one of the five that I've chosen to do the uh, the initial screen over the phone with, who've had no questions. You know, they've used um, they've used uh, expressions like uh, either, well, the HR person answered all my questions, or they've used expressions like, well, through the course of this discussion, you've answered all my questions, therefore I have no questions. Um, that's not good enough. You have to have questions. Um, Otherwise, it, it's it, it's it's telling me you're really not. It, it, whether you mean it or not, it's telling me you really you're, you're not interested. You ha, you it's impossible for you not to have questions. I mean, there's enough. For example, if I you know, there's enough that's happened at Dunham Bradstreet in the in the two years that I've been there. You know, the the, the firing of a you know it was like it was like deja vu for me because within three months of my being there, the CEO was fired, and so the alarm bells started ringing for me. Then we went private. After 12 months, now we've just gone public again. If you don't have questions about Dun and Bradstreet, in when, when you're talking to me, <laughs> then you know you're you're really not interested. So um, 
but but you know, a couple of other things. You know, you might. I I know sometimes sometimes people. If you're in a series of interviews, you know, where you're back to back to back to back with people, um, you you know, you and you've asked a question. Um, some people think, well, I've, I've already asked that question. I can't use it again. Well, of course you can. Um, you know, the, the person you're speaking to now doesn't know you've asked that same question of the, of a person, you know, that that you had that you talked to just before. They don't know. So ask the same question twice. Um, you know, show that you've done your research. Um, um, the uh, the last two successful candidates that came to me, both of whom were were relatively relatively young folks, they both came to the in person interview with me in January with a visible list of of questions. They had they had they had you know taken the time to write them out. Um, and they they came to they came to the interview and they had them visible. They both had probably each a dozen questions um, that were visible, and they you know, and we went through all of them. Um, so sh so show that you've done your research. Don't be afraid to you know to have your questions visible, um, and go through them. And and yes, you can absolutely ask the same question the same question twice. So. Um, and to not ask questions is, is again shows that shows you, you either you haven't done your research or you're not interested, and and it's an immediate red flag to me. And um, so, and, and again, you might think, well, shoot, of course you have questions, but you again, I've sat across the table with candidates who who basically said I don't have I don't have any, and it, and I was completely flawed. And then uh, finally. Um, and again, you wouldn't. Put, maybe you're thinking that's this is unbelievable, but less than half the candidates didn't send thank you notes after having a conversation with me. F for me, and for me, it's 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 common courtesy. But again, it's it's a it's a it's a perfect opportunity for you again to to resell you to me as a as a candidate. It's it's also a perfect opportunity if if you're thinking back after the interview of something that. You know, oh, I could have said that better, or, or oh, I missed an opportunity to say that during the course of the interview. It's an opportunity for, for you to, you know, to quickly and succinctly say, you know, I just want to reiterate something, or it's it's your opportunity to to sell me on why you know, I, you know, I really want this job. Um, in a uh, you know, in in pre-COVID days, it's a perfect offer opportunity for you to send a handwritten thank you note. Um, I've 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 done that. Um, if I if I thought a uh, something had gone particularly well, my uh, my younger son, uh, we both like uh, Jimmy Fallon, and Jimmy Fallon, if ever you've watched on a Friday evening, does uh, does thank you notes. And if you ever go to see Jimmy Fallon live, you can actually buy a set of Jimmy Fallon thank you notes. So if I ever think something's gone particularly well. My son bought me a set of Jimmy Fallon thank you notes. So if I think something's gone particularly well, I'll send someone a Jimmy Fallon thank you note, uh, which I'll I'll hand write. So um, you can't really do that again in a COVID world because the thank you note's going to land on a desk that's you know in an office that's no one's there. But but uh, so now you have to do it by email, I guess. But but in, when we get back to some sort of normal normalcy, a handwritten thank you note is very powerful. Can be very powerful. But again. You'll be amazed how how few people do it, and it's and I, and it's again it's a it's a great opportunity for for you to differentiate yourself from because less than half the, half of the people are doing it. So again, message here is uh, the basics count. If you do them well, you're going to differentiate yourself. So this is I actually. I, I'm not. Well, I did this slide, and I'm thinking it's kind of cheesy. But the the reality is, the candidates that that I ended up hiring, they did cover letters. They had really strong resumes. They thanked me, and they got hired. So uh, so let me let me pause there for a second, David. See if there are any more questions. Sure. Just want to remind folks that as you do have a question, please put the word question preceding your question. I do see one that didn't do that, so I did catch it, but it makes it easier for me with all these comments to make sure I see your question so we can address it. 
Um, Vivian has a question. Isn't it considered improper to bypass the HR person? To, to come to me as the hiring manager? Um, not at all. Okay. I, I mean, I, 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 I mean, other people might take a front to it. I, I welcomed it. I wanted okay. you to, I wanted you to. And it certainly may be the process where you then say, uh, thank you, uh, contact HR and we'll move forward. Absolutely. But no I, I, you, 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 uh, I, and, and what I, what, what I would do, I mean, it, it helped, it happened very seldomly, but the one individual who, who found me, I, I did exactly that David. I, I went to, to the HR recruiter that I was working with. I said, I want to talk to this guy. And he, so he made the slate of five that I spoke to. Good. Dara has a question. Do you find that other hiring managers at D&B hire people that are like them? I, I don't know that I can answer that, Dara. I, I really can't say. Okay. Um, I think, but I think that the, the process that we have is a, is a, is a good one. I think, um, you know, the, 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 we, we, we establish a relationship with the recruiters that we that we work with um you know the recruiters genuinely as and i'll touch on this when i get to it genuinely are trying to find the best person for the role and so i, I think that goes a, perhaps against the idea that they're trying to find mirror images of themselves i personally i'm not i'm absolutely i'm absolutely i'm absolutely not doing that so Ariane has a question. If your interview is via a panel of two or three people, how many questions should you ask? And the next question from Giacomo ties in, how many questions are too many? Um, I th well, I think it, some of that depends on how much time you have within the interview. I mean, if um, I think period, period, you should always sort of um, check with the person that you're talking with to find out how pressed they are for time. If you know, if you, if you, and if you're pressing up against, you know, if you have an hour, if the, if an hour was set aside for the interview and you're pressing up against that hour, and you still have more questions to ask, you should be checking in with the person you're talking with to see if it's okay to go beyond that hour. Um, and then, you know, you know, you know from that list of questions that you have, which are the more important ones. So I would, you know, lead with the ones that you really want to get, want to get answers to. And, and you know, and and run down your you know your list of of of, of in priority order. Um, I don't know that there's any specific number. The two guys I I I referenced earlier, they both had about a dozen. And uh, we probably we hit maybe we hit I don't know. I want to say we hit probably ten of them. You know, it it'll it'll depend. I um. In, in my in my Unisys days, I I had an interview with somebody. I interviewed somebody, um, uh, and it was scheduled to go an hour. But this individual, and I ended up hiring him, was so good that we ended up going for an hour and forty five minutes. And I we he asked every question he had, but he was so good, and the conversation was so good. And let's face it, it the inter the interview shouldn't be an interrogation; it should be a conversation. And the conversation which he and I were having was so good that it went for as long as it had to go, you know, and then, you know, then we called it quits. And I think he probably walked out knowing he had the job and I, I walked out knowing I was going to hire him. So, but you, I think out of courtesy, you, you, you know, you, you, you would ask the interviewer, you know, do we have time for more questions when you're bouncing up against the allotted time for the, for the interview. Okay. Uh, Giacomo asked, are video interviews recorded? and watched after the fact by others to make the decision? Um, I personally have not done that. Um, I, th I I personally haven't, wouldn't, I don't think I would record them. Um, some might, I've never done that. Okay. Um, Mike is asking, and it was asked earlier by someone else, what format thank you notes should be? Email, letter, etc. cetera. Um, thank you. I mean, to, to, in today's day and age, I think it's an email. Um, mm -hmm. When we get back to normalcy, I think it's either email or handwritten. Um, and I think, I think, as I said before, handwritten can make a tremendous impact. It, you know, so if you want, you know, if you if you know the, the physical location of the person to send it to, and you want to make a real impact, handwritten can can sometimes really 
really do that for you. Sure. And sometimes you can do both. I mean, you know. Well, one little trick that I've done, if you don't live too far away from where you're being interviewed, hand write the letter, <clears throat> then drive it to the post office and go to the postmaster and ask him to put it in the next day's mail. It gets there right away mm -hmm. for the same 49 to 50 cents. Yep. And of course, you could put it in a overnight envelope to get some attention because, of course, Michael, you mentioned sometimes letters don't get opened right away. Right. Ariane is asking, does the company have to tell you the interview is being recorded or should we just assume it is being recorded? I think they're, they should be. It's me personally, question. I think they have to tell you. I think anything else would be disrespectful. Sure. Dara is asking, at what point in the process do you make the hiring decision? So using the process that I mentioned earlier, targeted selection, um, I'm, I am do that scoring that I talked about after after every interview. So at, at the conclusion of the uh, the conversation, uh, after I've ended the conversation, or after I've shown the candidate, you know, after I've after I've walked him out, I go back to my office and I, I score the candidate. Um, but I don't make a decision at that point. I if I if I have other other candidates to talk to, I I score them after every interview, and then I go back and I. I review the bidding after the after at the at the very end, and and generally, as I said, the scoring bears out the gut feel that I that I already have, but I don't make the decision till the very end because I don't know you know until until the fifth candidate or the third candidate's walked in the door or walked or or actually walked out the door I don't know I don't know if I've seen the best candidate yet, sure. so I don't make the decision till the very end. And Vance has a question along the same: How do you score? quote, fit with the culture and department and team. Well, you can you can do that based on based on certainly after you've met the candidate face to face, you can absolutely do that. You you know, you you know, after talking to somebody for an hour. Um, I mean, do you absolutely know? I mean, you, you really don't until you've worked with that person for some period of time, but you can get a sense based on a face to face interaction. Okay. Sandra has a question. What do you recommend if you know the hiring manager and was selected for the screening interview? Do you reach out to the hiring manager telling him you applied for the job? I'm not sure I understand the, that question. So I'll take a crack at it. If you know the hiring manager, call the hiring manager before you apply for the job. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, if you have an established relationship, absolutely. Yeah. You have, so, you have a you have a superb advantage in, in that situation. Yeah, you might not even go see the screening interview person. Yes, so. if you have an if you have an established relationship, you should be leveraging the heck out of that. Okay, Grant has a question. What is the best way to make your questions list visible for the hiring manager to see? Yeah, you um, if you if you you know, oftentimes you bring a little portfolio to the interview. The, 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 the two guys had it was the first piece of paper on their portfolio it would they it was it was very obvious or you can you know if you have it if you have it separate they brought you know you can bring it out and lay it on lay it on top it you know it it, it, it you know there's nothing that you know there's you can i don't know about you but you know and an, an, an interview is a very stressful situation right so you could have you could go into the interview with the best set of 10 questions in your head, but with the, with the pretty good possibility, you're, you're going to draw a blank when asked, right? So there's nothing wrong with writing them down. And if then you can, at the time of, when it comes to question, you know, when the interviewer says, do you have any questions? You can just pull them out as a matter of, you know, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. And you can just reach into your portfolio and pull them out. There's nothing wrong. It's not a, I, in my view, that's not a sign of weakness. Okay. That's a, that's a sign of being prepared. Frank has a question. Where are you suggesting working in the cars? In the resume itself with the with performance metrics? Absolutely. Yeah. Every okay. single one of, of of every single one of those those bullets that you have in your resume should be a car. It should have it should be have a something it should be quantified in some shape or form. Okay. Michael has a question. Is using dear hiring manager heading, is that okay or is something better? 
I would think Dear Michael is better. Well, if you if you know Dear who Mr. I am, yeah, yeah. If, if if you know who I am, absolutely. So yeah, best case if you can find out who the hiring manager is or the head of HR, that would be a little bit stronger. Yep. Um, yep. Let's see. Uh, that's a repeat question. So here's from uh, Mike. Have you hired someone that does not meet the criteria, but you really like the person, charisma, intelligence, background, etc.? Um, honestly, no, I don't think I have. Okay. Char charisma is not going to get the job done. <laughs> Uh, Julie has a question. If you have a panel of two or three people, should you have a question for each person? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, from Dominic, I found that many interviews have moved to a 30-minute time limit, so questions can be limited in the interview. What are your thoughts? Um, I think... Yeah, I mean, 30 minutes is not a lot of time. So then you're going to have to be, you know, pretty um, judicious with with your questions. And and so then you you want you may only get chance for two or three. So they need to be um, pretty pointed, uh, you know, pretty probably most most focused on uh, the job, and and you know, so a good good solid questions about the job or good solid questions about the company. Okay. Uh, Giacomo asked, do you change your scoring after you, you receive the thank you note? Um, no. Okay. No, uh, I've never, I've never, no, I've never changed um, the thank, receiving a thank you note. Um, that's not a, that's not a, a scoring element, it, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's something that it's, it's makes, it makes an impression. Um, it's not, it's not a scoring element, element though. Okay, and it definitely, it definitely, it 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 does help to differentiate. It's part of that. It's part of the intang intangibles. Okay, um, Scott has a question. Based off other, you find a job, you research, and find the hiring manager. How do you approach them? So if you if you've found a job that you're interested in and you know who the hiring manager is, I would. Uh, do what I would do two things. I would I would uh, apply if it's if it's you know online. I would apply for it. You know, go through that that whole online drill. But if you know that if you're pretty certain you find you found the hiring manager and you are pretty certain that you know how to get to him via email, then I would do exactly what I did in the case of that school example and Ericsson Living, and I would reach out to them via email with a cop, you know with a strong cover letter and um, a copy of your resume and make your case. Here's why I think I'm a great fit for the role. Okay. And, and ask and ask him for his, you know, ask, you know, ask him to consider you uh, and, you know, setting up a conversation. Okay. You've got nothing to lose. You've got, you've got absolutely nothing to lose. Okay, from Dara, does DNB have a diversity inclusion policy? And if so, is it reflected in their hiring and promoting people of all background? Do the statistics bear out? Um, so if if you if you check out Dun and Bradstreet, DMB is known for several things. It's um, known as one of the most ethical companies in the United States. It's been that way for the last ten years. Uh, it's known as one of the best places to to work in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. It's been that way for the for the last several years, and it's known as one of the best places to work for LGBTQ for the last several years. Um, so, and those are things that the company is very proud of. Um, and and even through the change of ownership uh, and within the last couple of years. You know that could that culture could have changed, uh, but it has not. So hopefully that answers that question. Okay. Yeah, still got a lot of questions coming in. If you think we should move along, we could save the questions to later. Otherwise, um, yeah, I've got a few other things to to cover. So if yeah. let's uh, let's Power keep going. Through. Yeah, let's let's keep going, and then we'll we can. Uh, yeah. So folks, we will get to the questions. Don't worry. Let's yep. keep the slides. So uh, so this is my gratuitous picture, but I but I. I chose this picture for a very 
actually two very specific reasons. Um, and uh, actually, if chat is open, I'll give people, uh, actually, and there's a few people who've seen this before, so you can't cheat. But uh, anyone know where this where this where this place is? Not so much the place. Well, you may know the place, but what the uh, what the big rock in the middle? Anyone know where that is? Any answers on the chat, David? Let's see. I mean, I have a guess, but let's see. So a couple. Um, one says it's asking if it's half dome. That is someone that that's the right answer. And yep, yeah, uh, in Yosemite. It is. It's half dome in Yosemite, and so there's a very two specific reasons why I why I picked this. First of all, uh, when I when I first came to the United States, uh, uh, I I landed in Detroit, Michigan. So for the first few months of my stay in the U.S., uh, I thought that all of the U.S. looked like Detroit, Michigan, uh, until my girlfriend, who's now my wife took me to California for a vacation. Uh, and we ended up in Yosemite. And Yosemite from that day forward has been one of my favorite places in the entire world to go to because it is uh, stunning. And the Half Dome is obviously in Yosemite. Um, and it's 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 just it's just it's just gorgeous. But when when uh, the first uh, you know, white settlers found Yosemite back in the uh, 1850s. Uh, they took a look at Half Dome, and Half Dome, you have to understand, rises 5,000 feet from the from the floor of the valley. You know, pretty much you can see there, at least you know, vertically. Um, the, those uh, settlers in the 1850s took a look at yes at uh, Half Dome and said, "It can't be climbed. No human can climb Half Dome." Well, uh, you fast forward to uh, 2020, and not only can it be climbed, but there are human beings who can climb Half Dome without the use of anything other than their hands and their feet. And so I, I actually think that's a perfect metaphor for, uh, for job search, because when you're first in the situation, for example, I was in, um, you know, at the first day of that 21 month transition, you look up from the valley of of the you know of Yosemite, and you think there's no way out of here, um, but the reality is that there is, um, and everyone will eventually land. Um, everyone on the, everyone on on this on this call will eventually land. Um, I did. Uh, we just can't tell you. We just can't tell you when. Um, but what we can say is that. Uh, and this is something I learned from a from a really good friend of mine who uh, I met through the through the transition process, who to, who convinced me that every every day brings you one day closer, right? And so um, you will land, and you just have to believe that every day brings you one day closer. And you, so you have to stay relentlessly positive, and and just believe that you will land. And so keep that vision of, of half dome in your mind and just remember that if, if if a man with his bare hands and feet can can climb that thing, then just about any just about anything is possible. So moving on, just a, a few quick things and I'll power through some of these so we can get to, to questions. My observations in networking as as I as I said, my I made a commitment um, when I landed to to give back. So I've done a Tremendous amount of networking from the other side of the table now, as as the person you know, folks want to network with um, since landing. Um, and the thing I can I can tell you now, which I perhaps didn't always appreciate when I was you know trying to to land, was that it's it's highly highly probable that the person that you want to meet with has been through what you're going through now, and they want to help. So you you're not bothering them. So, so don't be afraid to reach out. And the only thing that personally that I would I would ask is just be respectful of their of their time, and and be be flexible. And in and in my particular case, be prepared to to meet kind of off off hours. So for me, it's it's very difficult for me to meet during the day, but uh, but I'm more than willing to meet um, off hours now. 
before when I was going into the office, that used to mean, you know, my commute, you know, I was, I could, you know, from the hours of seven in the morning till, till eight or coming home from six in the evening till seven, I was in my car. So I was a captive audience. So you could talk to me at any point in time during those hours. Now it's a little bit different, but any time from, you know, from 5.30 in the evening till seven o'clock at night, I'm yours. Um, so, um, so again, just be a little bit, be prepared to be a little bit flexible and, um, and be respectful of, of those kind of windows. Um, don't do what one person did to me and, and make an appointment for six o'clock. Um, miss that appointment and then call me at nine o'clock and ask me if now is still a good time. Uh, don't do that. Um, but otherwise, um, I, you know, I'm very, very willing to, to, to talk. Um, and once we've, once we've made that connection, you know, watch, watch, you know, keep the, keep the connection warm, watch Dun & Bradstreet. If there's not a, if there's not a role today, there may be a role tomorrow and jump when you see the right opportunity, because the chances are if the role has been out there for longer than 30 days, you've probably missed the boat. Uh, and then the only other thing I would say is that, um, you know, I can certainly help to make connections, but I, you know, uh, I can't create interest where, you know, where none exists. Um, so I can open doors and then the rest of it is, is, is up to you as the, as the, as the, as the, as the potential candidate. Um, and hopefully, you know, that it works out, but, it, but it, but also it, it may not. So I'll, you know, I'll be, I'll be very transparent. I, you know, I've probably referred over 20 people to, uh, to, to, to roles at DMB in the last 12 months. Um, a good number of those people have got to, to talk to, to recruiters at, at DMB. And maybe some have even gotten to talk to hiring managers at, as hiring managers at Dun & Bradstreet. Uh, unfortunately, no one has yet landed at, at DMB. Um, that's, you know, that's sometimes how, how it works. Um, maybe the 21st person will. I've, there's actually, um, the, the 21st person is actually speaking to a recruiter today at Dun & Bradstreet. You know, with a bit of luck, he might, he might, he might be, he might be the one that, that makes it. Uh, if not, there'll be a 22nd, there'll be a 25th, there'll be a 400th. You know, we'll, we'll keep going until, until someone makes it, you know, and that someone could be any one of the folks on this call, but, you know, we'll just keep going until, until it, until it happens. Um, when, I, as I said, when, when I, when I, when I, when I did this chart initially, um, the consideration was that HR might be the enemy. Uh, they also might not. Their motivation is to fill the, the role with the best candidate. Now I know there's, there's a whole bunch of, there's, there's, there's a lot of bad practice out there. I saw it, you guys see it where, you know, they, they're unresponsive. They, they don't necessarily give you feedback, but there are also, there are also a lot of good HR people out there. Um, and their motivation is to find, in all, I think pretty much in all cases is to find the best candidate. What, um, this particular individual convinced, he agreed with me, the basics that we've just covered will help you to stand out. But he also went on to tell me that, you know, you really should only apply for roles where you are an obvious fit. You definitely should only apply for one role at one, at one time at the same company. To, so to apply for multiple roles at the same company at the same time is probably not, not a good idea. Uh, direct outreach in the way that I've described it does work. Cover letters work. They are read. Um, if you can explain why you're a fit, he's going to call you. So if you do the things that I've described, um, he's going he's gonna to call you. Thank you notes are a must. Follow up is a must. And I'll give you a, I'll give you a great example in a second um, of why that's the case. And referrals will get a call. And I, w I will tell you, um, I, I have had very good experience. If, if I uh, if I make a referral, there's a there's a pretty good chance you're going to get a, a screening interview. Um, that's what happened with uh, the candidate today. I made a referral. Uh, I happened to know the recruiter. It wasn't this individual. It was another another person. But I I personally reached out to the recruiter. I asked that she screen 
this this person who happens to be a fairly recent college graduate he's he's been out um more than a year but uh, i asked that she screen him and she's screening him today so referrals will will generally get a get a call but while thank you notes are a must follow up is also a, a must um and he gave me the example and and of a uh, of a sales a sales person who was who was who was interviewing for a really senior sales position who uh, who made it past this you know the, the screening session so he he had he impressed the the recruiter the recruiter felt good about the candidate so put him in front of the senior sales leader who was recruiting for the position and um, the senior so the senior sales leader uh, interviewed this this candidate and really really liked him uh liked the individual enough that want that he wanted to hire him but the candidate never followed up so he never went back with an expression of interest in the role and so even though he was the leading candidate the hiring manager dismissed him because he didn't do what a good salesperson needs to do which is to follow up so he he failed a very basic test of this for this hiring manager, which is good salespeople follow up. This salespeople interviewing with this this senior person didn't follow up. He lost the job. So um, you've you've you know these are these are you know again basic blocking and tackling, and and if you don't do it, um, you're putting yourself as a, at a disadvantage. And this guy you know the candidate was furious that he lost the opportunity but he lost it for a you know a pretty obvious reason he didn't do what he should have done so um let's dispel a few myths no one gets hired in december not true i got hired on december 17th i actually i started my new role on december december 17th uh we hired um the project manager and the business analyst they accepted offers in december they began their new careers at Dun & Bradstreet in January. So that's not true. You don't get, you do get hired in December. Ageism, ageism categorically exists. Uh, we all, you know, the older folks on this call know that. That's, so you have to stress the value of, of experience and it is still possible to get hired at an older age. I got hired at 59. We've already dispelled the, the rumor about cover letters. People, people do read cover letters um maybe there's another rumor flying around that you know, people aren't getting hired in the age of covid not true people are dun and bradstreet is hiring um just a quick word about tools that i leveraged while in transition uh linkedin that's stating the obvious it's an invaluable source of of contacts uh it's an invaluable source of being seen um uh there are some great uh classes out there that will teach you about being seen i don't know if alex is still on i know he's uh he's done some great uh class work on that that if you haven't been through that you should you should be you should go through that um glass door that's a great tool to get some insight into a into the culture of a company but you need to take that with a pinch of salt because there's a lot of uh a lot of uh, disgruntled folks that also go on and, and uh post stuff on that um, New Start Career Network out of Rutgers. Um, I did. Um, I became a member there. I took advantage of their free uh, coaching there, um, because at one stage, you know, when you when you've been out as long as I was, you start to really doubt yourself. Um, I uh, I signed up for some for, for some for some coaching there. The coach uh, did a mock interview with me. You know, took a look at my resume. Um, he basically told me I was doing nothing wrong which was actually really reaffirming, made me believe in myself again. So um, again, avail yourself of that if, um, if, uh, if, if you need it. Uh, the public library and uh, some of the, the, the free uh, databases you can get from there are great if you wanna do some targeting. Um, I, I, I used Reference USA. I found companies within five miles of my house that I never knew existed, uh, that I was able to do, I did, um, I used uh, direct mail, you know, the USPS and 
reached out with a direct mail campaign. It got me conversations. It didn't get me jobs, but it got me got me conversations. Um, you know, again, it was great for targeting. Uh, NJ Biz. Um, I don't know if they still do do it, but they used to do you know the top X companies, top 50 companies you know growing in New Jersey. Um, that again is great for for targeting. Um, I used that top 50 uh, growing companies. I found companies, you know, I, I narrowed that down to between five and 10 companies that I was really interested in. Again, used that for targeting. Um, had some amount of success with that. Um, again, got conversations that, uh, that created some opportunities. Again, you know, again, it's it's all about creating opportunities and networking organizations. I, you know, again, don't go overboard. Um, I used uh, the, this Princeton group, um, the group in Somerville, uh, CIT and um, the Hillsdale group. Um, I, I got I got benefit from, from, from all of those guys. There were others I, I dipped into and out of. Um, you know, in a, in, a, in a virtual world now, you can, you can, you know, you can probably go to more, but I, but you could, you could spend all of your time going to them. And I would say, you know, be careful. Don't, don't go overboard, you know, find the few that work for you, the, which maybe the ones I just talked to, there may be others, you know, there's lots of good groups around, find the ones that work, um, but don't go overboard. Uh, and then um, not saying don't do it, but do your research before, before shelling out. Um, you know, we're all, you know, in, when you're in transition, you know, you don't have a whole lot of cash to, to shell out. So do your research before paying for job related uh, services. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying uh, do your research. A little bit about uh, Dun & Bradstreet. Um, when I checked earlier this week, there were 190 open opportunities with uh, over 40 in the Short Hills Center Valley area. So, um, so I would say um, check them out. As I mentioned, I've referred over 20 people to positions in DMB in the last 12 months. Um, I'm more than happy to continue doing that for as long as it takes. Um, there are roles, in, you can see there are roles in sales, technology, marketing, finance, content, data. Um, uh, and as I said, um, DMB is hiring. Uh, there was a thing on our, on our intranet the uh, the other the other day of the roles that you know the, the new people that have joined the company in June and July uh, so you know positions are being filled um, so like I say check it out I offer you, you the opportunity to connect um, please do um, I'm uh, as I said I'm more than more than happy to connect I'm more than happy uh, if you want to spend some time talking about where you're at in your in your search process, if you need someone to to talk to, uh, I'm more than happy to, to 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 talk about where you're at. I'm more than happy to share my experience if I can help in any way. I am more than willing to do that. Um, and I just want to repeat what I said before. Um, you will you will land. I can't tell you when. I can't tell you how. What I can say is that starting today, you are one day closer. Like I said, I, I can't tell you how. There is no right answer. What works, what worked for me, won't necessarily work for you. Um, what I can say is that you need a balanced plan of attack. There, you can't put all of your eggs into one basket. I, I met with somebody a while ago who was who was relying 100% on networking, uh, and networking is crucially important it absolutely is but it isn't the only answer so you need to spend some amount of time you know applying online you need to spend some amount of time networking you need to spend some amount of time working with recruiters you need to spend some amount of time doing targeting targeted networking uh, targeted mailing campaigns you need to be doing some amount of time trying new things um, because you know you never know what it is that's going to work, um, but but eventually you'll hit on the right the right answer, and eventually, um, you know, it'll work for you. But 
the overriding message of what I've what I've tried to say here is that there are some basics, right? You know, a, a cover letter, a well-crafted resume, um, trying to find the hiring manager on on LinkedIn and reaching out to him, um, going into a going into a, a, an interview well prepared with a good set of questions, and then following up and you know sending a, th a thank you letter, doing those things well. I am telling you, having sat in the chair of the hiring manager though doing those things well is going to differentiate you getting those basics right will will set you apart so with that i'm going to stop and we will switch to for any final questions sure and we do have some questions a uh, number of them so let's get have at it uh penny is asking uh if you only get one what question would you say would be the best to ask a hiring manager wow <laughs> um <clears throat> i would i it has to be something related uh, to the role uh, i you know, i can't necessarily tell you uh, you know what about the role but something something about the the job um you know a, a, a very pointed question about the job in terms of um what is it that the hiring manager is looking for in the role? What is you know something about you know what is the critical issue that he's trying to solve by hiring you know the, the person? Something critical about the role. If you if you only have that question, it's got to be about it's got to be about the job. Okay. Um, Dominic is asking, what do you think of some job gurus who say walk into an interview with a 30, 60, 90 day plan for your role? I th well, I think. Um, I don't know that I would do that in the in the first conversation, but oftentimes, you know, the, the the hiring process is more than one interview. So, for example, with me, um, it's at least a you know you, you you're doing a screening interview with the HR manager. It's at least one screening with me, and then and then a uh, a face to face generally. Um, when you when you're getting closer. I think having a 30, 60, 90 day plan uh, can definitely work. Um, I think for more senior roles, it's probably a very, very good idea. I think for, you know, I think for more junior roles, maybe not necessary, um, but for more senior positions, you know, if you're going, you know, so for example, a, a very good friend of mine just landed a really senior uh, sales role in the, with a pharma company, you know, a, 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 so a national sales role. With a, with a pharma company for her um, for her final set of interviews she went in with a 30 60 90 day plan so I think for, for senior roles when you know you're down to the you know you're you're maybe one of one of two or one of three then I think for those type of roles yes it can definitely definitely be a good idea okay Scott has a question it's written in a little bit of shorthand let's see if I get this right what if not meet all criteria and while charisms might not get the job done, what about drive, motivation, willing to learn new things? So if you don't meet all of the criteria, but you're willing to learn. That's what it sounds I, like. Yeah, I think so. I think that's going to then depend on what the rest of the candidate pool looks like. Um, I think if the rest of the candidate pool kind of falls into that kind of into the looks a lot like you, then maybe um, willingness to learn, you know, might set you apart. But if, but, um, but if, you know, but if I've got a fully qualified candidate versus a candidate who doesn't tick all of the boxes, but is willing to learn, then I, I may end up going with a fully qualified candidate. Some of that may also be situational at the end of the day, mm. but um, it, some of it, some of that will depend. Okay. Mitra has a question. What cue should I take to know when the interview is over so that I can thank you other than the time limit set at the start to not keep talking out of awkwardness? <laughs> um, generally, uh, I'll, I'll ask, you know, do you have any more, do I, do you have any more questions? That'll, that'll kind of be a, a key that I'm, I'm thinking about wrapping it up. 
or you know, or, or or if you have no other questions, you know, let me tell you, you know, about next steps, things like that. So there'll be there'll be those kind of cues, or I'll or I'll give you a time cue that says, you know, I'm, I, you know, I I have, I'm running up against you know the you know, a time you know, I have something else I have to go do kind of thing, I have mm -hmm. a meeting I have to get to, so you'll you'll get those kind of cues. You you would ordinarily get those kind of cues from me. Okay. Uh, Vivian asks, you spoke about persistence and follow-up. If yep. you do not hear from anyone after sending your resume and you do not know if the position is filled, how long do you wait before follow-up? Is it proper or considered being a pest to call? Um, so I, I mentioned before, I go by the three strikes kind of rule. So um, ordinarily, if... Um, I would, you know, I'm more, well, I would be more prone to, uh, to email, follow up via email than I would necessarily to call. If I had a, if I had a, you know, relationship with the, re with the recruiter, I might call. Um, and I, you know, I think, I, I think it depends on the nature of the relationship you've established. I think um, the recruiter that I mentioned, you know, I know candidates have, have called him and he hasn't had a problem with it. Um, you know, he's, if he takes your call, he's going to tell you where you know where it stands, and that it might be that he has nothing, you know, nothing to share. You know that, that this decision hasn't been made. So, um, you know, but but generally, I would you know, it's you know, I think you uh, you have to give it a reasonable amount of time to play out. So I wouldn't call inside of you know, inside of a week. I think you, you know, if you if you've had the, if you've had the interview, then you it's it's okay to follow up within a week, and then a week after that kind of thing. Um, and then, as I said, I go by the three strikes and then I leave it. Okay. Mitra asked, is a hiring manager or recruiter probably going to ask you politically correct questions, in parentheses, social issues, to feel you out for their culture in a sideways method? Uh, I wouldn't. Okay. I, I, you know, I, I, am I going to ask you what you feel about, um, uh, you know, the current, the current political situation or things like that? No, I would never, I would never do that. Okay. Okay. Ronnie is asking. Pretty often, interviews are arranged by HR or a coordinator. At times, have found it awkward to ask interviewers for their email address slash contact interview. What do you think about sending a note to HR or the coordinator and requesting that they forward it to you? Are there better options? Um, in those, I mean, I think it's okay. By the way. Um... For you to ask me for my for my contact details during the course of, during the course of or at the end of the interview, uh, but in those situations where you don't have them, then I think uh, it's perfectly okay to ask you know the recruiter for the for, for my contact information. That that's perfectly okay. Okay, good. Vivian's asking, did you learn most of your job leads from LinkedIn or other sites? What were your primary sources for job leads? LinkedIn and Indeed, primarily. Okay. Julie is asking you know, a similar question to earlier. What is the best way to follow up? How long after interview, phone call or email? Um, I generally followed up uh, with uh, yeah, after about a week, and generally via via email, candidly. Okay. Uh, Chung probably doesn't see what's behind you. Does D and B allow working from home? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, so so obviously in the current environment, uh, we're all working from home. From from March 16th, we uh, everybody is is at home. In uh, in a normal situation, um, that's very much role dependent. Um, so, for example, I was I was working in you know I was going into short hills every day, but there are you know there are uh, roles that are uh, working from home. So, for example, in my team of twelve, I think eight of my folks work from home. So, yes, it's perfectly possible uh, to work from home. Okay, and there's a lot of thank yous. Good. A lot of signs of appreciation. One more from Penny. How effective are recruiters with your hiring needs? Do you need to be cautious using them? Um, well, in, in Dun & Bradstreet, we don't have, you know, there's no, we, you know, we're paired with, a, with a, an internal recruiter. 
um, and that's the way the process works. So you would always be working with a with a an internal recruiter. In terms of external recruiters, I think um, I I, uh, I there were only a couple that I ended up being comfortable working with. I think you have to find those that you you can establish a relationship with um, that who are genuinely genuinely looking out for you as opposed to you know selfishly looking out for them for themselves. Sure. Okay, Mike. Well, um, that's it for the questions. Uh, one, or two, one or two of you may have a microphone open. So just again, I ask that you please turn your mics off as we wrap up the meeting. Um, so I want to thank uh, uh, Mike again. Uh, just a couple of things uh, following up what he mentioned about Reference USA. Um, I've used it also. It's a tremendous database. It's completely free to use with your New yep. Jersey library card. If you're outside of New Jersey State, check with your own local library. And if you don't have a library card, you just go into a New Jersey library, of course, when they're open again, and you generally can use it for free in there. Yep. Um, also, uh, Mike asked or mentioned about the NJ Biz lists. I did put the link in chat. It's uh, njbiz.com slash lists. And there's a number of lists over the past couple of years, so you can see those as well. So those are great resources. Thanks for mentioning those, Mike. Yep, for sure. Um, uh, I did just post Mike's slides, this slide deck, on the PSG of Mercer County website. On the right side of the website, there's a sidebar. It's on every page, the sidebar. And there's a link called Meeting Presentation Documents. So we are now in the middle of a meeting, and Mike has provided his presentation documents. That's what goes there. And the top of the list is Mike's presentation. Below that are all of our prior presentation links as well to slide decks and other information. Um, the chat that we have been uh, doing during this program, thanks for folks for being so active. Um, I will download that and post that in our um, uh, website as well in that same meeting presentation document section. If you want to download the chat yourself, in the upper left corner of your go to meeting screen is a logo that says go to meeting. It has got an arrow next to it. Click on that. When you drop down, there's a menu and there's an option to save excuse me, save the chat to your PC. Um, it only saves the public chats, not the private chats. Um, this program uh, is video recorded and I appreciate uh, Mike letting us do that. And so it will be on our YouTube channel later this afternoon or evening. On the right side of our menu, in the right sidebar, there's a logo of YouTube. Click on the logo, it'll take you right to our YouTube channel. Um, so I want to say thank you very much, Mike. This was It was so insightful and relevant to hear your insight uh, on this topic because there's so many coaches that are helpful and others, but here we get to hear it right from the perspective of somebody who's hiring. So thank you for sharing this and for your You're own self welcome. wanting to continue to be someone who pays it forward and gives back. You're very welcome. Uh, just, no, thank you. So uh, just before we wrap up, I want to let you know what's coming up over the next couple of weeks. Uh, we will be right back here, of course, next Friday, August 7th, and Tony Calabrese will be uh, here. He is a, a five o'clock club career coach, and Tony will be talking about your professional assessment. Um, so whether you're an entry level person or have years of experience, you kind of have to do your own assessment to understand just what it is that's important to you, just what your value proposition and how you can present yourself well to the next hiring manager. So I'm so glad he's able to talk about your own professional assessment. That's next week, August 7th. The contact information will be in our uh, event calendar shortly and, of course, in the email that we send out. Um, also, what we have the following week, August 14th, Ellen Wagner will be here taking the lead, learning how to manage your inner voices. So, you know, sometimes we have self-doubt or we have uh, very positive feelings. We can leverage those to be very effective all through the job search process. And Ellen will help gain some help us gain insight into that. Uh, other programs and presentations, uh, always appreciate that George Pace is keeping his Facebook uh, Sunday live webinars on Facebook. If you're interested in seeing George uh, Pace's uh, programs, it's facebook.com slash keep pace, facebook.com slash keep pace. Um, other groups that are active, um, next Saturday, August 8th, uh, will be the Breakfast Club of New Jersey. 
and they are meeting virtually as well. They always meet on the second Saturday of the month. And Lindsay Medlin is going to present Blockchain 101. If you don't know what a blockchain is or why you should know about it, uh, he's going to give a great introduction presentation on blockchain. I've seen it once before. I enjoyed it. So it's nice. He'll be at the Breakfast Club giving that program. Saturday, August 8th, 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, go to thebreakfastclubnj.com, thebreakfastclubnj.com. Um, our cousin organizations, PSG of Central New Jersey, they are doing their virtual presentation on Monday at 1030. PSG of Morris County are doing their programs virtually on Wednesdays at nine o'clock in the morning. So go look for their websites as well. And also New Jersey Job Seekers continues to be virtual on Tuesday evenings, uh, 7.30 in the evening. Um, it's uh, There's a go to meeting link and that is posted in our LinkedIn group. That way you can connect to that group for free as well. Tuesday, every Tuesday, 7.30 in the evening. Just look for the go to meeting link for the um, upcoming August 4th program. So uh, that's our presentation and our program meeting for today. And um, I will keep the um, session open for several minutes if we want to do some virtual networking. Uh, but uh, in, we'll get to that in just a moment. But just want to once again thank Mike for being a participant and presenter and continue to be a supporter of uh, Job Seekers. And of course, for PSG of Mercer County. And also to wish you all to have a good week until we can see you virtually again. Bye, everybody.